happen? Can you hear me? Okay. Welcome everyone. Thanks for coming in, in live audience style or virtually. We really appreciate you all coming to see this great talk today. Um, I am filling in for Jaime's main collaborators today, lucky me. So I got to chat with Jaime a little bit before this talk started. So I'd love to introduce him to you and give a little bit of his background before I let him come up and talk about his research. So Dr. Jaime Chavez grew up in Ecuador and actually completed his undergraduate degree there. He then came to SFSU and met Mo Flannery, our O&M's collection manager, doing their masters together. Um, a couple years later, Mo introduced Jaime to Jack Dumbacher, our resident curator of ornithology and mammalogy, and they started collaborating on work in the Galapagos. So Jaime studies evolutionary questions, um, specifically using field biology in combination with molecular um, genomics. And Jaime has been a long-term wonderful collaborator, was actually just appointed as a professor at SFSU in 2020, and just received um, his promotion to tenure track associate professor this past summer. So congratulations, Jaime. And with that, I hope I did a good enough job to welcome up Dr. Jaime Chavez. <laughs> Thank you. You did amazing. Uh, well, good morning, everyone. It is a pleasure for me to be here um, speaking about some of the program and research program that I have established in the past few years. I started as a faculty in Ecuador at La Universidad de San Francisco de Quito and a researcher at the Galapagos Science Center. So these are my long-term collaboration. And right now I have my lab at SFA State. And I've also been working as a research associate here at the academy. So everything comes very nicely together in terms of my passion for research, my passion for collections, and the interface between science community and engagement with students. So what I'm going to be doing today is talking a little bit more about the long-term goal of my lab and my research, and how is this impacting um, different uh, institutions and people that I'm being collaborating. So the major question that we're trying to answer um, in my lab has to do of just being amazed with the biodiversity that we get to see every time we go out into the world. So how is this biodiversity being generated and maintained is being this long um, standing question that I've tried to come about using one particular place um, to help me get close to this answer. And that has been islands, and particularly oceanic and volcanic islands, because they present unique characteristics that um, are sometimes hard to replicate. In particular, when you have islands that are of volcanic origin, that means that nothing really was there at the moment that these islands originated. They're far away. So that is already a big barrier for any organism to reach. And because you have several replicates, they became this petri dish like system in which the same conditions are repeated across different islands. You have ecological gradients and you can explore the roles of ecology at different stages. You have islands that have similar elevation gradients as well. And you have physiological constraints as you move from the sea level to the top of the islands. And in particular, islands that have been sitting on top of tectonic plates that move away from a hot spot, which is analogous to the Hawaii archipelago. The Galapagos has also been originated through this um, hot spot. And as the new islands are onset on this platform, the tectonic movement takes them away from the islands and new islands get formed. So you have now what we call the chrono sequence, younger islands underneath the hotspot, older islands away from it, and even islands that are now underwater that are many, many million years old. So that also provides a very interesting setting to look at the temporal aspects of evolution. And much recently, um, the Galapagos have also seen some new uh, evolutionary forces that have been affected their trajectory, which is the presence of humans. And as humans, we brought many different species to the islands. And we also are creating climate change and regimes that are 
unique and few um, species have been affected currently, but we, we expect that this climate change is going to affect directly in the future. So this is kind of like the, the background on, on why the Galapagos do present as these interesting laboratory to study evolution. So what I'm going to be doing today is talking about four of my uh, major interests on the Galapagos. And I'm going to be talking uh, the start and the kickoff with the beak of the finch. I'm just taking the, the, the copyright book by Jonathan Weiner here. Um, then I want to move into studying the rules of island evolution. Then um, a new aspect, again, that I mentioned, how urbanization is affecting evolutionary trajectories on the island. And a new um, component of my work in which I never thought I was going to be working with bacteria. And I'm going to be talking about how can we move from a macro vision to a micro vision and use, again, the Galapagos as this uh, place to get to understand these mechanisms. So uh, let's start with the beak of the finch. And yes, I need to use that uh, book because it was probably one of the most influential books um, uh, growing up as, uh, as a young scientist and really getting to know the power of long-term data sets by Rosemary and Peter Grant and, and the beauty on how very simple observations can lead to radical understanding of evolution through natural selection. And that's kind of like when my passion for Darwin's finches kick, kick in. So if you know, you've ever studied biology or not, this is one of those iconic textbook examples on how one species or one population that got to the islands diversified in multiple of forms. And the driver for this multiplication has been their beak or the trait under uh, selection that has been impacted by the different ecological conditions found on the different islands. The other important thing that we've able to find out here is that we now know through some uh, genomic work that this incredible diversity of beaks are actually controlled by only a handful of genes. So that also opens up a very interesting um, studies on how these genes of large effect are responsible for the majority of the phenotype that we see in this group. And this is something that can be replicated in other adaptive radiations that could hold the key to understanding how do you have such a rapid phenotypic variation in um, islands or in different organisms that are now uh, facing change, uh, changes in environment. And one of the things that is also interesting to talk about is how these uh, beaks are heritable. So meaning that this is a variation that gets maintained in the populations. So it is, again, one of those um, iconic systems to study natural selection. So one of the, the lines of research, besides the, the underpinning of the genetic and the molecular um, basis for beak uh, formation, has, uh, has been a little bit had to do with the thermodynamics and the thermoregulation of the beaks. Um, so this is a figure here of my colleague in his paper studying toucans. And one of the cool things about beak and, and big thermoregulation is that they act as a heat radiator. So during cold days, the uh, amount of blood that flows into the beak gets reduced, so it doesn't lose heat. But during hot days, one of the ways to lose heat is to actually radiate blood into their beaks. So the Fruit Loops friend not only is nice and colorful, but has a very unique adaptation to living in very hot environments. So with this uh, model, um, my question was, okay, great, we know a lot about the big morphology of finches and dramatic variation that you can see on that uh, left panel. To which extent is thermodynamics or thermoregulation a new force or any adaptation that could have been also behind the formation of these finches? So the question that I wanted to address is how does big finch influence the thermoregulation in this in this species. So one of the things that we did, the first thing is to get those fancy cameras and walk around uh, the Galapagos Islands and start snapping photos of finches at different times of the day. 
taking temperature, uh, ambient temperature, and see how the, the beaks and the birds are actually thermoregulating. And the other thing that the, we were able to do is like to get um, activity um, as a way to kind of assess to which extent the beak was providing any sort of adaptation where the days were hot or cold. So one of the things that we find is that larger beaks that we know are ha will have a high able transp uh, transpiration at higher temperatures. So the hot it, of the day it is, the more yellow and red you will find on these beaks. And it's pretty costly to do that. So one of the um, things that we are able to do is to measure uh, in detail the amount of oxygen and CO2 that each one of these birds were producing as we uh, manipulated their, their temperature. And one of the things also that we were able to look here is that um, during hot days in the morning, it is very costly for birds to be out. So larger big birds tend to go out earlier when it's colder. And smaller beaks that are can thermoregulate more uh, easily, they are out during the hot parts of the day. And to measure the, the cost, like how costly this was, we built this uh, microwave in which we put the bird inside and we crank up the temperature. And we were measuring um, CO2 production and oxygen rate. We knew that we have gone too far when you start smelling you know, chicken, like fried chicken. So we just kind of take the birds out and let them go. No, no birds were harmed during this uh, experiment. But this was uh, one of the ways for us to really measure the upper limit of the thermal regulation of these birds. And one of the things that we find out is that birds that actually live in um, higher elevations, they were um, gapping sooner. So that means that the birds in lower elevations where in, in, in this, this gaping is pretty much when they just give up. Their beaks are open and the last breath comes out. It's like in, in some cases, you can even see a little cloud coming out. That was the thermal, you know, the upper limit. That's when we stop the, the experiment. And that was something that will tell us that there is a local adaptation. So birds in the lowlands seems to have this gaping event at highest temperature. So birds in the lowland, could we stand higher temperatures than birds in the highlands? So if you think about you know, climate change, populations that are going to be found in higher elevations are going to see uh, warming, and those species are not going to be fully adapted to live in hot environments. So we're trying to figure out if this, this adaptation is uh, genetically uh, based. So we're trying to not only map if we can find some of these signatures in the genomes, but also using maps to predict temperature in the future, can we identify populations that might lack this capacity and that we could probably do something in terms of their conservation in the future? This is analogous to the coral reef um, studies in which there are some genetic signatures of corals responding to warming in the water and some species not. So this is, we could think about that this could be one of those associations in which genotype by environment could lead us to identify populations in higher risk in the future. The second thing that I want to talk about um, with the finches had to do again with bacteria and their microbiome. So one of the cool things about this group of birds is that if you know a little bit about what they eat, it would strike you that you know some of them have beaks that are particularly used to crack seeds and small seeds, medium and large seeds. Some of them are using their beaks to feed on flowers and soft parts of the plants. Some other ones use twigs and uh, spines to get bugs out of the uh, trees. Cactus finches will feed on nectar and pollen of mofuntia, and vampire finches will feed on blood and eggs of marine birds. So there was one paper that I really um, get my, my bulb up when I was reading about how during the diversification of a group, and particularly in this case, Darwin finches, um, when these species are acquiring new diets, there is a fundamental, this is a fundamental driver for the evolution of their gut microbiome. So if you have a population that is diversifying and eating different things, there should be a microbiome that would follow up in these type of adaptations. So the question in this part of the talk has to do with how does diet affect the finch gut microbiome? 
And to do that, so we just go up there, we get the birds. And if you know a little bit more about microbiomes, um, we know very well that whatever you eat will be reflected in your bacteria. You know, uh, vegetarian people and carnivorous people will have very different microbiomes. So there is a tight association between what the birds eat and what the microbiome should look like. So the prediction for this work was um, if we have this diversity of diet in these species of birds, if we plot it, each one of those diets, we should be able to find these clusters of bacteria that are going to be very well defined by their diet. So the prediction would be that you have birds that feed on blood on one corner, birds that feed on uh, seeds on the other corner, and birds that free, uh, feed on bugs on the other corner. And these are bacteria identified through their genomes. So to do that, we use 16S uh, RNA, a part of the bacteria genome, to identify species up to a lineage or even to the genus level. And we were able to um, compare across different species if this prediction of diet association and microbiome was um, correct. And what we found first is that when we excluded vampire finches, we did not find any associations. So I cannot tell you what type of bird you give me the sample based on their microbiome. So there's a lot of, of shared microbiome between birds that feed on seeds and on bugs and on flowers. What I can tell you is that if you give me a sample of a vampire finch, I can tell you with a high significant difference that this bird has unique bacteria that allow this bird to feed on blood. And I want to show you here um, a little video, and I don't know if... This is the only bird in the planet that would actually create a wound on a bird. This is not the only bird in the planet that feeds on blood. We have birds in Africa. But there we go, on the back of these um, mosquitoes, and they start choosing the base of the feather of the wing. And as you can see here, this is a, um, a learned behavior. So there's other finches around on the ground learning how this is done. And they take turns. Usually the adults are going to be the ones being the first ones into provoking uh, and making this work. And this happens more heavily during the dry season when there's not much water. So, and the food resources are low as well. So this behavior is being seen on two islands the island of Darwin, which is on the top, you can see there, and I mean, in the horizon, and on the Wolf, the two most uh, northern islands on the Galapagos. And when we um, look into what does it make these birds look so different in the microbiome, we found one type of bacteria that is called fusobacteria. And when you dig a little more in the literature, this is a bacteria that is also found on carrion eating birds and carnivorous birds. So your vultures and your eagles have the exact same bacteria that a viparin finch has in the middle of the Pacific in this rock. The other thing that we wanted to look at is how, okay, so how can we also learn a bit more about other, bird, uh, other species that feed on blood? And to which extent these bacteria that we find on birds are commonly found on other hematophagous species. So we did a parallel analysis and study with bats. And we wanted to find out if bats have the same bacteria that we find on our finches. And we found two interesting things. The first thing is that we find a weak taxonomic uh, convergence. That is that the bacteria that are found in finches are very different than the bacteria found in bats. Bats actually possess more uh, of different type of bacteria you can see here in, this, in the top graph. The, the yes bar represent the type of bacteria that are found. And in the, the case of the finches, which is on the bottom one, you can see that it's more orange versus blues on the top. So the two species have different bacteria, but they're doing the same thing. So when we look at the function of the genes that we know are used in the metabolism of man, many of the characteristics of blood, what we found is that actually the genes are similar. So we have convergence in function, but they're hosted in different bacteria. So there's a convergence in the function of the bacteria that allowing these species to access blood, but they actually have very different host bacteria 
that are systematically and taxonomically different. So this convergence is, is partial in their taxonomy, but it's high in their uh, functionality. So this is still opening a new lines of, of research in terms of like what is the origin of these bacteria? How do they got here? Because not all other finch on the island possess this type of bacteria. And so we, we're trying to come up with some, some ideas and, and some more um, sequencing of other species that we can compare to. The other uh, big part of our research lab has to do with the rules of island evolution. And in particular, we want to know a little bit more about the origin, the evolutionary history, population genomics, and systematics of species that are not very well studied. The Galapagos have iconic species that have been explored for many, many decades. But there is a bunch of species that we still have very little knowledge about. So one of the first things that I started um, in the Galapagos is to try to collect species and samples of a species that will allow me to test some of those island rules. And some of those island rules have to do with the island kernel sequence in which species that are arrived to an older island will probably be older. And as these islands arose from the bottom of the ocean, populations moved to those islands, isolating themselves and creating this temporal aspect of diversification. So there should be a correlation between the island age and the age of this lineage. Also, I'm trying to compare, as I mentioned in the first slide, how adaptation and ecology is shaping any of these adaptations. So you have islands of the same age with very similar ecosystems, to which extent you find the same adaptations, or is isolation and drift actually more important in generating these differences? And the rule in which you know people have seen the Galapagos that you find usually one species endemic per island. So very it's strong either competition or the opportunities of these lineages once they get to the island is just to explode and take over the island. So cases like geckos in which most geckos are found one species per island. Um, the cases of Scalesia, which is also a very cool um, system to study um, adaptation to different environments. So you have Escalesia plants on the top of the islands and Escalesia that are living in more desertic areas. They have very similar leaf patterns. So you have repeated adaptations to different environments, although not being closer to each other. Um, and in population genetics, we're trying to figure out how long ago these species got to the islands, how have they move around the islands, and is there any uniqueness of populations that we think might should be considered units for conservation, although there could be identified as one big species like the Galapagos uh, fur seal, we are finding that there are very strong population genetic signatures and the difference in their behavior could be something that we should be to, uh, looking in the future to um, assess conservation and, and potential. The other important thing that we're trying to find out is how has these small populations, because these are not your you know, big colonies of species, there's a lot of species that are less than you know, a couple hundred uh, individuals. So what has been the consequences of historical human um, introductions and land change in these populations? So we have um, experienced declines and local extinctions of populations. Some of these populations have bounced back after their eradication of grazers and herbivores like these goats. And you can see here the impact on the species that have been invasive on the islands and the species that will depend on grasslands, they're being extirpated from several islands. But some of these uh, species are back or maybe they were not uh, found during some censuses. So one of the things that we're trying to figure out is how can we understand the genomic consequences and how populations that are so small thrive on these islands? Is this the signature of an island population? And how are these species going to um, withstand future conditions? So one of the things that we're focusing uh, in the genomic work is on the signatures of reduced genetic diversity, like runs of homozygosity, and also some of the inbreeding uh, coefficients. So these are going to be our matrix to identify which populations might be suffering. And this is the work that was done uh, using uh, specimens here at the academy. And uh, this is the Galapagos rail. Again, a very um, 
skulky, not very well-known species. Even people in the Galapagos, you ask them, they don't even know these species exist because it's very secretive and lives in high, densely um, uh, thickets of, of fern in the high. <laughs> so one of the things that uh, we did here is we are looking at populations that are found in several islands, and we're finding that there is a strong genetic um, structure. But not only that, that we're finding that some populations have signatures um, that were, are reminiscent of very strong inbreeding depression or population bottlenecks, like these high levels of uh, runs of homozygosity in islands like Pinta, which is an island that was completely destroyed by goats. And after the eradication, somehow these populations were able to subsist in a very, very small number. So now we have an idea that this population is probably one that needs um, higher conservation and, and, and really um, some programs to keep these populations alive and probably even some reintroduction or, or captivity, uh, breeding captivity. So genomics is helping us to understand these hidden patterns of biodiversity, but also to identify potential populations that might require uh, some intervention. The classic example of mockingbirds are also going to um, give us an example of how populations have subsist in very small numbers on islands. And we found that there is a tight correlation between the size of the island and the genetic diversity that you find. So again, going back to you know, island biogeography tenets, we can now look at how genetic signatures are actually correlated with the environment and with the ecological conditions. We can also map some populations that have gone through model necks. And these are populations that have been extirpated, like Floriana mockingbird, from which only lives in two rocks. And by the way, that's what uh, Jack is right now working, trying to see any of the reintroduction of species over there. So again, these are the new tools that we're um, using to identify these populations that have signatures of inbreeding and these signatures of reduced heterozygosity that is going to be important in conservation and in this case, the um, translocation of species. The other work that um, I'm going to present here is um, a work done by one of my students, and he works also here at the academy, is try to disentangle this, this mystery about the lava heron. Lava heron and the striated heron, if you go to the Galapagos, people still, and the guides, they still cannot tell if this is, these are two different species or the same species. Um, in some of the work that uh, my student uh, Ezra was working here is trying to use genetics to disentangle this, this dilemma. Are we going to suggest that these are two different species or one species? And we are actually finding way more complex uh, stories here in which a genomic analysis of UCEs, which are your ultra conserved elements, tells us one story on how the lava heron is more related to the green heron here in North America. But when we look at the mitogenome, it's actually closely related to the striated heron. So we have one of those interesting cases of um, phylogenetic mitonuclear discordance. So we're trying to figure out what could have happened in their evolutionary history in which these species either capture mitochondrial from the striated heron that could have been populations coming from the north in their arrival to the islands. And we're trying to find out ways to model these type of events to come up with the best and more uh, in, important uh, decision towards is this a different species or not. But most importantly, why do we have this morph that is so uh, fixed on the islands? And obviously you can tell me, well, you know, a, a dark heron living in la dark lava might be better off at either not being eaten by predators and or being a good uh, predator by eating um, fish. So we're trying to figure out the molecular basis of coloration and also trying to find out to which extent this phenotype has been uh, fixed on populations and why we still have some individuals with this traded heron, like in this photo on the left, that still has most of the genetic information that relates to a lava heron. So all this, this different uh, research that we're doing in the lab can only be done using uh, collections. Because what we want to do is we want to really reconstruct the evolutionary past. And collecting samples in the Galapagos is pretty damn hard. 
um, permits are hard to get. It's expensive to go and try to get to these sites. So having collections um, pretty opens up new lines of, of research. So in the case of the rails, you know, we were um, lucky to have access to the collections here at the academy. And we have, you know, this, this very interesting paper in which we compare the, revol the evolutionary histories and population signatures using what the rails looked like before the humans arrived with their goats and how that has impacted the rails that we find now. So the only way to get data from the past was to go and get collection uh, data from the Galapagos um, expedition that the Academy did in 1905, 1906. And we also using collections um, across the US by to compare the plumage coloration that I was talking to you about the, um, the lava heron. And the last part of this talk in the rules of island evolution is um, a very exciting project that we just got uh, funded and that we're going to be working in collaboration with Jack. And um, I have good news for um, Athena that we just purchased the P2 solo after um, many, many months of um, battles with institutions. So we're going to um, start using um, long reads and, and next generation sequencing to try to build genomes of species. Um, and we're trying to do this on the Galapagos. So we want to bring this technology to the islands as a way to not only democratize science and involve locals in the research, but also to um, get data in, in a more efficient way than, as I mentioned, working on genetic permits in the US is pretty hard, in particular, you know, trying to import species from the Galapagos. So we have identified a set of species that, again, are very poorly understood and or known. And those are going to be the Galapagos petrel, uh, which is um, probably one of the most um, iconic species of marine birds in the Galapagos, was split from the Hawaiian petrel, so it's in, an endemic species in the Galapagos. Um, it has suffered tremendously uh, through either their habitat modification because they nest on the highlands. So they actually burrow in, in, the, in the top of the islands, and these are areas where agriculture has, has a huge impact. So nesting sites are low, and also study the lava gull, another dark individual. And this is the most uh, rare gull in the planet. So we now have the samples here. Um, Jack brought them um, last summer, and now we, we have now samples to start working and building these genomes that would allow us again to go back and ask those questions in terms of their origin, the population uh, diversity and their condition and see if there's anything that we can propose in their conservation. The other part of my talk has to do with uh, living on the islands. And if you have been to the Galapagos um, or you will be going to the Galapagos, make sure that your uh, breakfast is well take, take care of because there's finches everywhere and they will steal your bolon and your popcorn um, and this is one of the things that you can see very commonly. So finches on islands have been um, interacting with within this, this matrix since the 70s, where we start having the first um, big movement of people onto these islands. So if you already know a little bit about the impact of food in the diversification of finches and how important these different ecological conditions on islands have had in the radiation of finches, you can imagine what these new forces in terms of food might be doing. So if any species that had had a long evolutionary history of responding to changes in food and diet, finches are going to be the ones who might give us a better understanding of what is happening now when a new item or a new force like human food is being put into the scene. So what we want to look here is how do finches respond to these new food sources? And this is work that has been done in my lab um, by Adan and uh, our colleague in Canada, an Ecuadorian researcher, Paola. And what we are trying to do here is to measure the beak of the finch in different scenarios. So we are comparing two different species of finches, the medium and the small ground finch that live both outside of the urban setting and inside the urban setting. 
And we have been collecting data since 2002. So we have a very um, comprehensive temporal data on how these finches and their beaks are being shaped. And one of the interesting things you can see is that there is a significant effect of the beak morphology of the finch that lives in the city, that the finch that live outside of the city, and that these changes are actually predictable. So every single year, we have that the changes follow the same trend. So it doesn't really matter what island you are or what year you are, these birds are being um, modified by the food they're eating. Um, and we are now trying to add more species and try to compare um, behavioral work that um, we've, we've already set up some um, cafeteria experiments. So we can put a bunch of seeds that the birds eat normally and rice and have a camera there and pretty much see what are the preferences. And it seems to be that the preferences are set. So birds in the city, they will eat the, the rice and the bread, if we have some bread. And they will not go for the seeds that are usually after. But if you put those dishes on uh, uh, non-urban sites, finches don't even respond to anything. So they don't even really know what you're doing in there. So there's already a preference that's been set in the finches that live in the city. And a big um, work that we're also doing has to do with my colleague, uh, Sarah Agnuti from, from UConn. Uh, she's more like a, um, a field parasitologist, is the impact of invasive species in their health. So we've been working a lot in um, avian pox, avian malaria on the islands. There, these are two um, introduced diseases, a virus and, and uh, uh, a blood parasite. And we're trying to link those to um, the El Nino events. We're finding that some species are more prone to uh, or susceptible to have higher levels of avian malaria. But also that living in the city um, can have multiple um, evolutionary outcomes. So in some cases, living in the city have provided some of the chicks in, the, in, the, in some of the finches with a higher um, diversity of microbiome that the counter species in the in not natural natural sites some species might be more prone or less prone to the infection of the parasitic avian fly which is the number one enemy for most of the terrestrial birds this fly will lay their eggs in the nest of the of the birds and the larvae would crawl into the chicks and eat them pretty much alive until they pupate so they will destroy and, and all the chicks inside a nest. So there's been some work in terms of how are these species been uh, adapting to this um, new parasite that has been introduced. And also, what uh, does it mean to have all these human material, including hair, that has, in this case, um, we have two chicks that are just dead out of entanglement inside the nests when the adults are using fibers and plastic and human fibers into their nests. So we see a large impact of how humans and our activities are impacting the evolution of these birds. And in particular, we're also looking at how, again, as I'm talking about this behavioral work that we did on, on the left-hand side between the food preferences. So we've seen that birds are actually changing their behavior. There is some microbiome changes as well between urban and non-urban sites. So birds are feeding on human food. In this case, we'll have lower genetic diversity of bacteria in their bellies. And also one new aspect is that we have only focused on one direction of the evolutionary impact of seeds on the beak morphology. But this is also an eco-evolution loop. Finches are also preying on plants and that is a massive um, selecting force for the phenotype of the seeds. So seeds will have very different hardness and length of these spines as you have different community of birds living in there. So this eco-evo circle is, is allowing us to understand how these two forces are operating in the diversification of beak morphology, but also how are plants responding to such an important um, force in the predation of these seeds. So we've seen a lot of morphology changes between islands depending on what kind of birds you have. So bigger birds will actually 
encounter seeds that have longer uh, spikes and they're hard versus islands where you don't have those birds, the, the seeds are actually smaller and softer. So there's an energetic cost for the plant, depending on what kind of bird lives around it. So the last part that I want to uh, touch base today has to do um, with how all this information and decades of work done by many scientists that have come up with these rules of, of island biogeography and evolution, how can now we use that and get into this uh, micro world? So one of the things that we are now trying to do in our lab is to which extent the below ground biodiversity are governed by the same mechanisms that we know are governing the macro biodiversity. And as we mentioned, there are already some of those rules, like I mentioned earlier, the progression rule, older islands probably will harbor older species. Is there any um, correlation between diversity of species and the um, more diverse ecosystem that you find on these islands? Is the one island, one species rule also apply in terms of this micro biodiversity? And to which extent ecological pressures might also have an impact with that. So for this work, um, this is a work that we did during the pandemic. So we were able to work with the uh, UK Research and Innovations to hire local um, families and guides on the Galapagos to go in different parts of the islands and collect soil. So this is all work done remote uh, in support of the communities during the pandemic where they didn't have any source of income. We were able to supply uh, for 70 um, scientists or local scientists to go out and earn a living for a year and train them in the molecular sequencing using Oxford Nanopore to get this microbiome genetic identification. And the data analysis was done by uh, one of my students, Lorena, in my lab and my undergrad, uh, Jessica. So the idea here is that with these three islands, we're going to test to which extent isolation, ecology, and island age might be also behind the traits and characteristics that you may find on the soil microbiome. So in this case, one of the things that we are uh, we found is that we do find that each island has its own unique microbiome. So you can see here in the in the first uh, panel on the left, every single island has its own genetic signature for microbiome. And one of the things that we can also check in out is that the soil conditions of these islands are different. And it's, this is not super um, hard to understand. If these are islands that are different in age, they have very different um, erosion regimes, islands that have been eroding for 5 million years ago versus one that is eroding for 2 million years ago. Um, so some of the conditions and the characteristic of the soil is also behind these differences. Um, we find dramatic differences in richness between the islands. So the older island of Cristobal in the orange here is way less diverse than islands that are younger. And the composition also differs a little bit between the islands. So some islands might have more relative abundance of a type of bacteria and other ones will have less or even unique bacteria like uh, in Isabella, you have more cyanobacteria than any other island. So what does really means is that somehow the same forces that are generating biodiversity are also affecting microbioma, uh, microbiomes, and, and there might be an interplay between those two. So we're trying to connect these two worlds uh, to which extent this setting can help us understand even more about the evolution on these islands. Um, so I wanna you know, kind of wrap up a little bit about these, um, this lab uh, that we have set up in collaboration with the Academy and with Jack in which we have now this, this very interesting dynamic between students at the academy, faculty at the academy, and we've also been part of the role of outreach and education. So we've been already invited to, to present our work and really um, inspire the, the community here on, on the importance of the role of the academy in, um, in not only research, but also education. Um, and one of the things that we are actively doing is the, this, this idea that we need to continue collecting. Um, most of my work is based on museum specimens. And on the Galapagos, this is something that is very, very hard. So only um, we went to the Galapagos and we started giving talks 
And this is a talk that um, I was able to give um, this summer at the World Summit of Island Sustainability with the message that I was given is pretty clear. We need to grow collections in the Galapagos. We need to have people out there actively collecting and documenting the biodiversity. This is the most critical time for us to be putting these uh, specimens in collections that can help not only researchers on the Galapagos, but anywhere else in the world to access to them. And also, it have helped my students. I mean, this is the work done by Ezra. Without visiting collections across the, the US, the work that we're doing to understand the origin of biodiversity could not be done. So it is um, an ingrained in, in our mission uh, in my lab to continue fostering and, and try to communicate why collections are still and should be supported in the next um, uh, 100 years. I want to um, also acknowledge um, one, one person in particular uh, that I, have, I didn't have the, the, um, the opportunity to meet in person, um, and is uh, Professor Robert Bowman. Uh, Robert Bowman was a faculty at San Francisco State. Um, his role in what Galapagos is now is, is huge. Um, he not only went to the Galapagos early on, but helped founding the Galapagos, uh, the Charles Darwin Foundation. Most of his work was on finches. So all the work that I've been inspired to read and learn is actually one of the pioneers who also inspired Peter and Rosemary Grant. He brought Darwin's finches from the Galapagos to San Francisco alive. So he had an aviary at SF Estate which right now is pretty awesome that we actually, the space is our lab. And now we have the specimens in our lab, specimens that were brought in the 70s up here. Um, and one of the most important things that he did is that he worked very hard with local governments in Ecuador to start what is now the Galapagos National Park. So without scientists like Robert Bowman and all the collaborators, um, the Galapagos would not have seen an early establishment of a national park at the critical moment that it was. So he was also honored the uh, Medal of Honor by the government of Ecuador for his work. Um, and the vision of, of uh, Robert Bowman in terms of uh, preserving areas like the Galapagos through research um, is, is something that I, I take um, as an inspiration for, for my work. Um, so with that, I just want to thank so many people and organizations that have helped us through our work, including the Na Galapagos National Park, the Universidad San Francisco de Quito and the Galapagos Science Center, my sister institutions in Ecuador, that without them, there's no way I could have gotten all this work done. And obviously to the Academy of Sciences, which has been an, an incredible synergy and really gave us momentum to continue this program that um, I'm super excited to, to see where it will, will take us. And to all of you, thank you very much, and I'm happy to take any questions. for that wonderful talk, Jaime, and um, congratulations on all the amazing work your lab is doing. We're gonna take questions from the room in a second, but I'm gonna sneakily ask one first. <laughs> I was noticing um, while you were talking about Robert Bowman, um, well, I worked in the library archives for a little bit and processed some of his um, documents and equipment that he had. And I know you've been in the bird collections. I was just wondering if you had a chance to go through the library archives here. He has some really interesting correspondence. And I think if I'm remembering correctly, it's like a little device he actually built to measure bird beaks and things like that. So. Yeah, I mean, I have not uh, gone through the, the archives here, and I'll be super curious to do that. Yeah. One thing that we uh, found when we were taking over the space at SF Estate is I found a binder with uh, photos and his drafts for his publications. So back in the day, um, there was like this weird printing system before you submit your papers, and you had to print your own uh, images on a certain type of paper. So it's not just like sending a PDF or on your A4 pages. It, it was an interesting system. And I have several tryouts of several figures in that, that, that 
uh, Robert Bowman have in there. And we have the specimens of Darwin finches that he brought with him to the to, to California. And obviously they're dead now, but we have the, the specimens in our collection. So one of the things that I want to do, as you've probably seen um, at SFS State, we're building a new science building. And I was able to um, influence the architects to build some sort of displays on different uh, floors. And what I want to do is obviously with the help of the specialists of display and museology is to use those spaces to portray not only um, specimens or have some biophilic uh, events, but also to show uh, people. And, and, and I know that the Academy has done such a good job bringing um, hidden um, stars in, in research in the Academy and in California. So I want also that space to be used to broadcast these, these contributions to science. And I think that um, we can start with uh, the work by Robert Bowman in there. That sounds like a really cool collaboration. Yep. Thank you so much. Um, you. Questions from the audience, Darrell. Hola, excelente uh, presentación. Hey, um, yes, yes. I have a quick question about the beaks. So I'm kind of, maybe I didn't totally pay attention since I was taking notes, but what's the overlay and the correlation? So if you're a large beak bird, do you have a longer tolerance in the day? Does that help you? Or is it, so is it unlike the toucans? I, I, could you explain sort of a little bit more yeah. about that? So one of the things is that when it's hot during the day, these birds are gonna be uh, putting more blood into their beaks. So to keep their bodies cool, but that is highly costly. So either you are not gonna be out during the hot part of the day, or if you are, your activities may be limited. So birds that have higher beak are usually on the cooler parts of the day out doing most of their activity. So they can still be around without putting too much effort in cooling down. So a bigger beak means bigger surface to uh, ex exchange and lose um, heat. Um, I think that the, the, the issue there is if you are in uh, a cold part of the day, right? I mean, then if you're losing your, your, your heat, it's not so, so bad because you're still keeping your metabolic rate lower. So when we put these birds in these machines, uh, a larger beak gets to the higher threshold faster. So a hot environment will be a deterrent for a larger beak to be out, which it is counterintuitive in the fact that you have the, the toucan example. What happens is that the activities that these birds are doing are much uh, less than the birds that are smaller beaked during the same time of the day. So when you go out to the Galapagos, you usually don't see on a hot day, the two species interacting together you have more like a, like a temporal segregation during the day. Okay, lots of other questions here, Sarah. Hi, Jaime, thank you for the talk. Um, I was curious about the urbanization study. Um, you mentioned that the, the birds that were in um, the urban environments are um, having very different preferences for food and, um, I was, and then that was, of course, um, in contrast with the ones that were in the non-urban spaces. Um, I was wondering if you had looked at bird, well, two parts. What are their ranges? Like, I guess some of these cities um, aren't massive in size, and I had kind of thought that maybe birds would be living in the forest and coming into the city. I don't know. <laughs> but um, I was curious, like, what are their ranges that they move around in? And then in the sort of transition zone between the urban spots and the the less urban spots, do you see something of like a gradient or? Yeah, no, I think that's a, a great question. And one of the things that we are trying to do is every time we, we get a bird in the net, we color band them or we band them. So this way we can tell if, and because we go back every year to the same site, we cap and capture and recapture the same birds. So we have not, and very, very rarely have one bird from one site that is not urban have found in the urban side. And we're talking about 
three, five kilometers. So their home ranges are very, um, they're very phylopatric. And there's a, a paper that um, one of our colleagues did. We put actually uh, radio track uh, satellite tags in these birds, and we were able to measure their home range, and they're tiny. So these birds are not moving that far. So any effect that you have in one area might be unique to this population, and there's maybe not effect of this long distance movement of birds. And for the transitional zone, um, it is a little bit hard because some of these places are harsh div divisions between an urban site and national park. So some places might be easier to understand the transition if you have like an agricultural land first and then some of these parks. But um, it, it depends on where I think you go and you decide what you decide as a transitional zone. Um, it's not as a, a gradient that you will think. Usually is the, the area that has been delimited by the park where you can build. And there is a, literally a road, a huge three-story building, and your national park next to it, right? So there's no transition there, right? Versus other parts that you start driving up the mountain, you have you know, the different ecosystems taking over and then the agricultural zone. So I think it's more hard to try to identify what you would consider transitional. Um, but in this case, I think that transitional was um, like a road that will take you from the beach, which is more you know, um, isolated, towards the, the city. And we find, in this case, almost the same um, diversity of microbiomes of these species. Um, I'm also wondering if I misheard you, but when you were talking about the microbiomes of the dirt in the different islands, mm -hmm. and I looked at the diagram and I looked at my notes and it seemed that you were saying that there was less um, variability in the older islands, which seemed very, very surprising to yep. me because, you know, you figure they're older, they have more time to diversify and... Right. How could that be? What's the explanation? Or I think possible? the explanation has to do with the erosion. So these are older islands that probably have seen more erosion events. They're being watered down. Um, and the connection that we find between the elements on each one of the islands might also explain. So maybe the, the, the amount of carbon that is accumulated in younger islands might be very different to the ones in older islands. So we're trying to figure out to which extent this age um, difference that we see on the diversity and the richness of the bacteria has anything to do with the geological erosion or the condition of the soil. And this is only with, uh, across one ecosystem, right? So that ecosystem, which we thought was going to be equal in terms of the three islands, uh, turns out that still the soil composition is different across the islands. And um, so that could be one of the explanations for that. Older islands also might have suffered more uh, modification by humans. Like Cristobal is an island that has been dramatically modified. A lot of species are actually extinct on, on Cristobal. So it's probably uh, a combination of stress on the soil and natural erosion as the islands age versus younger islands that may have more contribution of vegetation um, and more rich soils. But again, this is just, you know, our interpretation of the data as not microbiologist and soil geologist. Yeah. Right, and we are not, for instance, um, adding, and again, this is data only on islands which we had humans inhabiting because of the pandemic, we hired people living there, but we just got data from Fernandina, which is the youngest, and we wanna go and collect from Española, which is the oldest. So maybe this trend that you mentioned could complete the same pattern that we see on Hawaii. I have the next question. Thanks for a fascinating talk um, and wide ranging. It's really so fast, interesting. Um, my question, I'm, I'm curious like Sarah about the urbanization processes um, that you described. And I'm wondering if you could tell us more about what specific 
um, observations you're making about beak, is a beak size? What, a, what about morphology are you seeing? And then what are the sort of vectors here? Are, they, are, 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 this, are these tourists that are giving, you know, that are feeding the finches? Is this from the garbage? Is there variation in the food that they're getting? And how is that connected specifically to beak size? Yeah. That's, and then that's, finally, oh, are you connected? Sorry, this is a three-part question. Good. I'll um, remember it. it. Are you working on, I mean, are, are there efforts, I'm guessing, to educate tourists and, you know, to, to not, um, how, how are, you, are you connecting with any of those efforts to not feed finches or leave garbage out or whatever those vectors are that you're observing? Yeah. Thank you. All right. Let's see if I can try to do that. The first one. Um, so we're trying to look at the, the, the beak as a component, size and shape. Um, and one of the things that we see is that it is the, the shape of the beak that changes a little bit more. In particular, when we look at the depth of the beak, it seems to be the, of the three measurements, the length, the width, and the depth, it seems that the depth is the one that has the larger variation. And is usually the one that's probably used to crack larger seeds. That's where the, most of the force might be in. Um, the other thing that we're finding is that the standard deviation, which is the variation around the mean in the urban sites, is much wider than in populations that are in the wild. So it seems that balancing selection is pushing an optimum around a mean that is functional, and there's a little bit of relaxed selection on the urban site. So you find birds that are a little bit off, much away from the mean that birds in the wild parts. So these are kind of like the signatures that we find in, in terms of the beak morphology. Um, the second question, um, I don't know what it was. Um, something about the, the vectors. Right, so one of the things that we thought and we still don't have the data, um, whether is the human food that is affecting the, the, this pattern um, or the amount of introduced plant species around the urban sites. So urban sites are plagued with grasses and urban and domestic plants. And those tend to have smaller seeds and multiple seeds. And it's not hard to, you know, actually, it's very common to see finches around the streets eating the seeds of grasses. So to which extent is actually the amount of food that humans are putting there or the human impact in the landscape affecting the big morphology is, is a good next question, right? And I think is probably a combination of both or even more just the plants that we have introduced and allowed to take over the urban sites more than the green plantain and the popcorn directly. Um, and the conservation aspect of it um, is something that we actively are giving talks at different parts and at schools and at the Galapagos Science Center. We have a, a hub for dissemination of this data. Um, luckily, the rules of the park are very clear and people visiting the islands um, are all told not to feed the wildlife. Um, but as you saw there, I mean, if the damage is done in terms of the plants that are around, little can anybody do about it. And when you're around these, these urban sites, um, you just get up from your table after eating and the finches will charge to your plate or even before. <laughs> um, so although you are, you know, suggested not to do that, it, these birds are, are ingrained to, to eat your food. Did I do a good job? Three good questions? Okay. All right. Well, thank you so much, everyone. I know there's still questions in the room, but we're a little over time. I hope if you're here in person today, you'll join us for IBSS Cheers, where hopefully Jaime will be. Yeah. Or you can try and sneak around and find him at Nightlife. And there's some stickers here of the lab, if anyone wants a sticker of the lab. I. I hope I have enough. And if you could all join me in thanking Jaime for giving this wonderful talk. Yes.